of sins. There's been the argument that the law is always not enough to classify one action as wrong or right. And the reason is that uh, the law is usually inappropriate for regulating certain aspects of business activity. Especially, you see, not every business activity may be lawful, but not necessarily, you know, moral. So sometimes we may say that certain behavior in business is immoral, but not necessarily illegal. You can take, for instance, if a mind, you know, who has been granted legal rights to mine in a certain concession, end up polluting a certain river. You know, he's doing genuine business, all right, but it tends to pollute a certain, you know, river, the only river which provides uh, portable water downstream for people living, you know, uh, downstream there. This behavior may be legal, but not necessarily uh, moral behavior. They also say that the law sometimes, you know, is slow to develop in certain areas, uh, especially those areas that are often unsettled. The proverbial saying that uh, the views of law grind slowly, but business decision will not wait. Business decision usually is taken with a flip of the finger. I mean, be before the court make a decision on a certain litigation, the business indicators, economic indicators will have changed. Exchange rate will not be waiting for the court to make its decision. And uh, interest rate will not wait either. So within a certain spate of time, business indicators would have changed. And that may go against, you know, any uh, uh, businessman whose issue is still being litigated in court. Then usually we also employ certain you know, moral concepts that are not clearly defined in law. For instance, when we say good faith, who measures the good faith and what is bad faith? To what extent can we describe an action as reasonable? So all these are moral concepts which are being used in law but really have not been defined precisely. So that will tend to make us think that, yes, if ethics is the source of every law, it will mean that you go to certain places, you are likely to have certain law being defined in a certain context and uh, uh, going against another definition in another context. This is because usually ethics emanates from what we call culture. You see, culture is the total way of life of a group of people, a group of people who are defined within a certain geographic area. So it will mean that what is considered culture is specific to a group of people. Culture is defined to include what we eat, what we wear, the language we speak, and so many other things, the kind of work we do. So you will tend to see that Sometimes the kind of language we use in a certain context may actually be accepted within our cultural settings, but it may be disallowed within another context. What I'm trying to explain here is that culture is relative to the group of people who consider that to be culture. So cultural relativism actually suggests that there is no one right way of behaving. What is a good behavior is actually culturally determined. So you see, they say when you go to Rome, do what Romans do. There is no culture that defines one action as wrong or right. The culture that defines an action as acceptable is actually relative to that particular culture and may not transcend into other things. Other people disagree with this notion and these people are categorized as the moral absol absolute, absolutists. The moral absolutists believe that, look, there is uh, 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 no one single culture relative to a given group of people. Culture is the same everywhere. 
culture is absolute. And if culture is absolute, whatever the culture defines may also be classified as an absolute culture. And so ethics can actually be absolute. When we say something is absolute, it means it is universal. So what is right in one context may necessarily be right in another context if the context doesn't change. So in Ghana, what is right should necessarily be right when you go to uh, 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 Nigeria. I must also indicate that, you see, there is this saying that, look, when you um, uh, uh, travel, you do not do anything that you wouldn't do at home. It makes culture and what is right or not universally acceptable. This group of people uh, uh, perhaps pushed for the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, by the United Nations. The first article being, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and in right. Every human being has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. And this is accepted everywhere in the world. So business ethics, for instance, is clearly, you know, what is right or what is wrong in the workplace. And so whatever guide behavior could be described in the context of what uh, business ethics. This makes managers perform certain uh, uh, major roles. Three of them is highlighted here. We can describe managers as economic actors. It means they play a certain economic role. They can be described as company leaders, and they could also be described as community leaders. Economic actor because the company is supposed to make profit, and so the manager who tend to make profit for its organization is described as uh, an economic actor because you need to survive. The company needs to survive. The manager becomes a company leader because he has followership. There is no leader without followership. I mean, we cannot talk about leadership that doesn't have followers. Otherwise, who are you leading? So every company leader seeks the welfare of his people that he's working with, his subordinates, his employees, and make sure that their morale is boosted to achieve organizational goals. So we say the uh, uh, manager plays a certain company leadership role. Then finally, we say that the manager is a community leader. He's a community leader because the operations of the business which he is managing is likely to affect people in the community. Let's take, for instance, this gentleman who was born in a certain community end up becoming the manager of a certain mines in that community. This leader is supposed to also take the interest of the community, you know, in terms of whatever operations that the mines engage in. So you don't pollute the only source of water to that community because you are supposed to act as a company or a community leader. So what is ethics? We say ethics is actually the science of morals. It's a branch of philosophy which is concerned with human character and human conduct. And so people say that it is that code of uh, uh, moral standards which tend to classify one action as good or right as against what is bad and wrong. So ethics is quite, you know, broad. Based on the definition of what is right and wrong, there are three major moral management that we can identify. Three major moral management. One, we can have what we call uh, the immoral manager. We can have what we call an immoral manager. And we can have what we call a moral manager. Maybe we want to take it one after the other. When we talk about an immoral manager, an immoral manager is usually the manager 
who does not accept any kind of ethical principle. In fact, he doesn't believe in it. He doesn't take that into consideration when he's taking decision. And his strategy is virtually immoral. Exploit every opportunity to the letter and make excessive profit even at the detriment of the interests of his stakeholders. This is directly opposite moral management. A moral manager is the one that conforms to the highest standard of ethical behavior. He accepts all ethical principles, work in the interest of all stakeholders, and make sure that he remains within the professional standards of conduct as much as possible. The last model of moral management is the one that does it between the two referred to as a moral manager. This manager is indifferent. He doesn't really, you know, uh, care about whether it is immoral or it is moral. In fact, he accepts every ethical principles and see them, you know, to be existent. But he applies them as and when it meets his own interests. He really doesn't see its relevance to business. It is only when it is in his interest that he would use it. He sets his own rules of the game and applies them appropriately. And usually, these people tend to always have strategic intentions to reap profit in the long run. So three types of moral management. We have the immoral management, moral management, and the amoral management. I have been able to summarize this in this table based on ethical norms they believe in, motives of their behavior, goals, and their orientation towards the law and how they put up their strategy. So generally, how do we recognize that there is a certain ethical issue? We normally will be guided by what we call this ethical framework. In a scenario where you are asked a question on, you will be expected to recognize, one, that there is an ethical issue within the scenario, get the facts around the ethical issue, evaluate alternative action to take that will correct the ethical issue, make a decision to test one and test it, reflect on the outcome of the test, and then if it is good, then you hold it aside. If it is not, then you may want to start the steps again. So in an exam situation, you would realize that if I give you any scenario, I will be expecting you to be able to decipher all the ethical issues within the um, scenario, get all the facts ready, and then possibly identify alternative action that you may want to take, settle on one of the action, make a decision on which one you have settled, test it, and reflect on the outcomes. If it is good, then we move on. If it is not good, we start the process again. This has been summarized in this table and the kind of questions you would ask yourself in that case. Thank you, and this will be the end of the first lecture.